chapter 30. I'm also going to read from Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We thank you that you sanctify us by your word. We thank you that you guide us through life and instruct us all according to your word of truth. And we pray now that as we turn to your word and to what our confession of faith says about your word, about the government of the church, uh, that you would instruct us and see the goodness of government, that all of us are creatures and therefore under authority, chiefly your authority, but that it's good also to be under proper human authorities, especially the authority of your church. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, chapter 30, paragraph 1, which we'll be dealing with tonight, says this, the Lord Jesus as king and head of his church hath therein appointed a government in the hand of church officers distinct from the civil magistrate. So this is the chapter on church censures, but any discussion of church censures, or as it's commonly called church discipline, uh, necessarily begins with a discussion on church government. A church government is sometimes called church polity, but government's the more common term, so we're going to stick with that one. Uh, this paragraph here in our confession opens by first recognizing that Jesus is the king and the head over his church. And so while the Bible tells us that Jesus is king over all things, he's king over all of his creation, he exercises his kingship in a special way over his covenant people. You see this all throughout the Old Testament, for instance, where God rules over all the nations, right? There's not a single nation that's outside of his lordship, and yet the Lord called Israel to be his holy nation, and he gave them specific laws that governed their moral conduct and their civil affairs and their religious worship. But the Bible especially focuses on the kingship of Jesus Christ over his church. Uh, Isaiah prophesies about this, a well-known uh, passage about the coming of our Lord. Uh, speaking of Jesus, Isaiah says this, For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The, Lord, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so here... In this prophecy, Jesus, the coming Messiah, is identified as a governor, as a ruler, as a king over a kingdom. He inaugurated his kingdom, we know, as we've seen in the Gospel of Mark in the morning service, that Jesus inaugurated or he ushered in his kingdom during his public ministry, through his gospel preaching, through his miracles and calling sinners to repent and to believe. He was calling people into his kingdom to become citizens. And then Jesus, we also know, he will consummate that kingdom that he started. He'll consummate it when he comes again, the second time when the knowledge and righteousness of the Lord covers the earth. But until that day, Jesus is building his kingdom by his word and spirit. And in this age, his kingdom is visibly manifested in a particular group of people called the church. Chapter 25 of our confession, if you remember all the way back there, the chapter in the church, we were told this, that the visible church, the church that we can see, it consists of all those throughout the world that profess the true religion and of their children. And it is the kingdom 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, the house and family of God, out of which there's no ordinary possibility of salvation. And so the visible church is the kingdom of Christ, and every local church effectively serves as, as an embassy of that kingdom. Even though Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth, as he says in the Great Commission, he exercises that authority, that kingship, in a rather unique way over his saints. The confession here in, in chapter 30 says that as the king and head of his church, Jesus has appointed a government for his church. And so the church then is both, you can think of it as an organism, meaning it's alive, it's made of people, it's made of us, right? But it's also an organization, meaning it has structure, it has order. Uh, the church is structured and ordered according to its form of government. And so government then is an essential element and component of the church. Uh, historically, uh, Protestants have recognized three marks of a true church. The preaching of the word, the right administration of the sacraments, and church discipline, all of which assume the existence of a church government. And so you cannot have a church, you cannot have a congregation without a governing body to oversee that congregation. And so it's clear Jesus has ordained that the church be governed, but who are these governors? Well, the assembly tells us, chapter 30, first paragraph, church officers are those governors. And by this it means elders. And that includes both ruling elders and teaching elders who are also called ministers. And so Jesus is the supreme ruler of his church who exercises his rule through these lesser rulers, through elders. The elders are the only persons who are lawfully ordained by Jesus to administer his authority and rule in the church. And so they rule in the name of Christ, but always under the authority of Christ. And now this raises an important point that needs to be reinforced whenever we're talking about human authority. And that point is this, that all human authority is delegated authority. Okay, God appoints civil magistrates, but they are not unlimited in their power. They can't do whatever they want. They are accountable to the Lord. God appoints husbands as heads of households, but they likewise are accountable to the Lord with how they exercise their authority. And God appoints elders as the governors of his church, and they are also accountable to him. That's what Hebrews 13, 17 clearly says. No human being then has inherent or innate authority because everybody's a creature. There's creatures, there's the creator. God delegates authority to his creatures. So all human authority is delegated by Christ, and Christ is king over all earthly powers. And when it comes particularly to his church, he delegates authority to elders who are to shepherd and govern his people according to his word. And now, obviously, uh, not every church has the same form of government, government, because even though we all have the same Bible, we all read from the same Bible, we reach different conclusions about a lot of things. One of those things is church government. And so the three basic forms of church government, which I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with, at least to some degree, the three basic forms that are practiced throughout the world are Episcopalian or hierarchical government, then there's congregational government, then there's Presbyterian government. I'm not going to dive into each one. You can Google all those differences if you're interested. Uh, but, but I'll give us some information. Some of your Episcopalian or, or hierarchical churches would be Catholics, uh, Anglicans, Methodists, Eastern Orthodox, uh, Baptists and non-denominational churches practice congregationalism, which emphasizes uh, the independence and the autonomy of each congregation. And Presbyterianism is practiced by Presbyterian and Reformed churches like ours, the OPC, uh, the PCA, the URC, the RPCNA, and other acronyms. We like to 
have a monopoly on all the acronyms in Presbyterian circles. Uh, but we get that term Presbyterian. It's a biblical term. Uh, it's from the Greek word presbyteros, which is the word for presbyter in the Bible or for elder. And sometimes when talking about elders, the Bible uses another term called episkopos, uh, which is translated as overseer or bishop. Now, as Presbyterians, we believe that these terms are all synonymous, that they're all talking about that same office of elder. Those in the hierarchical camp would disagree with us, but to each his own. Um, now, one of the foundational principles of Presbyterianism is that local churches are to be governed not just by one guy and not by the whole congregation, but by a plurality or a group of elders, elders who are elected from the congregation to serve as their representatives. And so Presbyterianism is a form of representational church government. The Bible teaches that church members have a right to select their governors, and that there should be multiple governors caring for each congregation of God's people. And so where do we see this kind of thing, uh, this, that elders are appointed to, to govern God's people? Where do we see that in the Bible? Well, a number of places. In Titus chapter 1, verse 5, Paul tells Titus to ensure that elders, in the plural, are appointed in every town. In 1 Timothy 5.17, Paul says, Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in teaching and preaching. In 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, there the Apostle Paul outlines the list of qualifications for the office of elder. In Acts chapter 20, Paul's exhorting the Ephesian elders, and he says to them, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all of the flock, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. 1 Peter 5, there Peter instructs uh, elders on the type of character they're to have as they shepherd God's people. And finally, Hebrews 13, 17, which I read, I'll read again, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they're keeping watch over your souls, as those who will have to give an account. And so the basic idea here being that Jesus is king and head of his church, right? And he exercises his kingship through these officers. So they don't rule by their own authority or even by the authority of the church, but by the authority of Christ. It's Jesus who calls and ordains men to the ministry. And he ordains men to the ministry through his church, through the laying on of hands by other elders, but it's our Lord who sets men apart for ministry to serve as representatives of his people. And so we govern in the name of Christ while submitting ourselves entirely to the authority of Christ and his word. This is basic to Presbyterian government. In addition to this, Presbyterianism also emphasizes what's, what can be called the, the connectional nature of the church or the oneness of the church. In the Nicene Creed, we confess this. We confess that we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. Those are four attributes of the church, the first one being that the church is one. What does it mean to confess that the church is one? Well, it means that Jesus did not die for many different churches. He died for one church. Jesus does not have many brides. He has one bride, right? Therefore, individual churches should be connected to each other in meaningful ways. Uh, you see this in Acts chapter 15, where elder delegates or, or commissioners, as they're called, uh, from different congregations, they, they got together with the apostles to figure out a theological issue. They discussed it. They ruled on that issue, and then the elders informed their congregations about what was determined at this meeting. And so this shows you the oneness of the church, that churches should be connected, which, which rules out the congregational idea of being independent and autonomous. 
And so this connectional nature of the church, this oneness, is why we are part of a denomination. You know, a church that's totally unaffiliated or totally unassociated with other bodies isn't being faithful according to Scripture. And and it's very dangerous to be in that position, to be a church like that, for a reason we'll soon get to, which is that leaders in these churches aren't accountable to anyone. And so even though Emmanuel is its own congregation, we are part of the universal church, and we're part of a denomination of churches called the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Uh, The oneness of the church uh, is, is why we do things like joint worship services with other churches in our denomination. It's why we have pulpit swaps. It's why we budget for our Presbyterian denominational committees. Uh, Jesus wants us to act as one church because that's what we are. This is why we have official partnerships with other Reformed and Presbyterian denominations like the PCA and the URCNA, the OPC's Book of Church Order, uh, which explains our form of government in in much greater detail than I can do tonight. But, But that book calls these other denominations, it calls them churches of like faith and practice. So we have a high degree of fellowship with other churches like these because we hold to the same or similar confessional beliefs. Our beliefs and practices are close, which means that we can have close fellowship. This is why some people, when they come to us from other denominations, they're allowed to transfer their membership to Emmanuel to join our church. You can transfer to us from another OP congregation or from one of those a church of like faith and practice. And that basically means here, one one of the benefits of that is that we don't make you take the membership class because everything that we're going to teach you in the class, we assume that you've learned in those other churches since you were part of a church of like faith and practice. And now it should be said, uh, since we're talking about the church's oneness, that we would obviously love to be in close fellowship with every true church of Christ. Across the world. We'd love for that. And we will be in fellowship with every church when we're all gathered in heaven and everybody's a Reformed Presbyterian. (laughs) But on this side of heaven, our denomination cannot have official partnerships, official uh, connections with other denominations or with every other church or denomination Uh, that don't hold the same confessional beliefs, right? We have such divergent beliefs and practices that we simply cannot have official partnerships with every every other denomination. The kingdom of Christ, uh, it needs to be said, is certainly bigger than the OPC. It's bigger than the Reformed tradition. You don't have to be Reformed. You don't have to be Presbyterian to be a Christian. But we only have so much in common with non-Reformed and non-Presbyterian bodies, For example, we do a joint Good Friday service with our friends over at Belmar Baptist, and this is a wonderful thing. It's been a blessing to both congregations for many years, but we will not plant a church together because we can't. We can't. And and I'm sure Pastor Bill Cook over there would say the exact same thing. We we don't have the same views of salvation. We don't have the same views of, of the sacraments or of church government. And so planting a church, this it's not in the cards. And so since we strongly believe in the oneness of the church and the the Catholicity of the church, that the church is universal, since we acknowledge those things, then we also acknowledge that we have a true spiritual bond with our brothers and sisters across the world. We're all in Jesus' family. We're all united to him by his blood and spirit. But again, when it comes to official partnerships, we can only link arms with those who have the same or very similar beliefs, which is one reason why confessional statements like ours are so important. Now, the church's oneness also manifests itself in Presbyterianism's three-tiered system of government. Okay, what do I mean by that? Well, in the OPC And in other Presbyterian denominations, we have three tiers or three levels of church government. You already know the names of these. The session, 
the Presbytery, and the General Assembly. Our Dutch Reformed brothers and sisters in Dutch Reformed churches like the URCNA, they have the same basic thing, but they call their levels the consistory, which is like the, the session level. Classis is the presbytery level, and then a synod is the general assembly level. So same basic idea, different names though. But we get this idea of, of different levels of government from the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, which I referenced, where these elders who, who govern their own congregations, they also come together to govern the churches of a particular region, to decide on this theological issue that affects a whole region of churches. That's what Acts 15 is about. And so, our session here is the group of elders who govern this local church. The presbytery consists of all of the ministers and all of the elders of a particular region, and they govern all of the congregations in that region. And so our church, Emmanuel, is part of the regional church of New Jersey in the OPC. And our regional church is overseen by the Presbytery of New Jersey, which meets four times every year. And then, finally, there's the General Assembly, the third level, which is the governing body that oversees all of the churches and our entire denomination, and this assembly meets for one week every year. So these three governing bodies, they do a lot of things, a lot of things. But one of their key functions is to serve as courts of the church, which is where this discussion of church government in paragraph one ties into the issue of church censures and church discipline. So, for instance, a session might censure a member by suspending him from the Lord's Supper. Okay, he committed some sin worthy of that level of censure. But if that guy thinks that, well, he's been mistreated by his elders, that it's an injustice because of reasons X, Y, and Z, then he has the right to appeal that censure, which sends the matter up to the next highest court, the presbytery. And then the presbytery considers the issue, determines if the session was right or if the session was wrong. And then they instruct the session and this individual accordingly. And so Presbyterianism doesn't only foster uh, connection and oneness in the church, but it's also designed to ensure accountability in the church. And congregational churches where there's no higher authority, no higher court to appeal to than just the local leaders, what can members do when their pastor misuses his authority, when he's abusing the sheep spiritually in some way? What do they do when the other elders or other leaders are protecting him? Often they have no recourse, and they end up leaving the church. It's very sad. But in Presbyterianism, members have the right to bring charges against their leaders, and if their leaders won't hear them out, they can then bring their complaints to the next court, to the Presbytery. And so while Presbyterianism is not essential to the existence of a true church, right? We believe, again, in the Catholicity of the church, the oneness, there's other bodies that aren't Presbyterian, they're legitimate churches. Presbyterian, Presbyterianism is not essential to the existence of a true church, but we do believe it's essential to the well-being of a church. And now the last thing that the confession mentions in this paragraph right there at the very end is that ecclesiastical government or church government is distinct from civil government. This brings us back to chapter 23 of our confession on the civil magistrate and that issue that we talked about uh, at length called sphere sovereignty. So God has ordained certain spheres of authority, uh, the family, the church, and the state. Civil magistrates have God-given authority over the civil life and the civil affairs of their citizens. But the church is a sphere that's distinct from the state. And so the church has its own government that's distinct from the government of the state. And so there is a biblical separation of church and state. Whenever I hear Christians say, that's not in the Constitution, you know, we don't want to separate. No, we want 
a separation of church and state. Trust me, that is a good thing. It's biblical. It is good. But both church and state are, are God-ordained institutions, but they have different functions, they have different responsibilities, different powers, different jurisdictions, and different governments. Okay, the state is an institution of common grace, whereas the church is an institution of saving grace. The church, as we've seen, is Christ's redemptive kingdom. It's a kingdom, the Bible says, that is not of this world, and it's composed of the citizens of heaven, and not the citizens of just any one nation or all the nations of the earth. No, that's not what the church is about. The church is spiritual in nature. And so Jesus has charged his officers, and not civil magistrates, he's charged his officers to wield their spiritual authority for the well-being of his people. Now, why is this distinction here uh, between church and state so important when it comes to church censures? All right, it's in the chapter on church censures. What does this have to do with church censures? Well, one thing here that's worth noting is that there is a view of civil government, maybe some of you have heard this before, called Erastianism. Okay? A. A. Hodge, the son of Charles Hodge, he lists three elements of Erastianism in his commentary on the Confession. But for our purposes, I'm just going to read the first element. He says that the first element of Erastianism is this, and this will give you just an overview of what this form of government is about. It's that the church is an organ of the state to accomplish one of its general functions, and consequently, that there is no government of the church independent of that of the state, but that its officers, its laws, and their administration are in all things subject to the civil government. That's why we like separation of church and state, by the way. And so the basic idea of Erastianism is that the state rules over the church and therefore has the authority to decide ecclesiastical matters, matters related to the church's doctrine, the church's worship, and, yes, the church's government and discipline. But Erastianism is wholly unbiblical because of the idea of sphere sovereignty, which is clearly taught in the Bible, and, in addition, the idea that God has placed limits on all human authority, especially civil authority, because civil leaders, when you read the Bible, they tend toward tyranny, don't they? God places limits on all human authority, especially civil magistrates. The Bible says that in the New Covenant era, church and state are separate institutions, each with their own government, and magistrates don't have the authority to step into the church's sphere and decide religious matters, including matters of discipline and censure. It's not their jurisdiction. It's the jurisdiction of church officers. That's what Jesus says in his word. And so this means that magistrates, for instance, cannot coerce elders, uh, threaten elders with fines if they don't discipline certain church members. Um, they can't tell elders that they're not allowed to discipline certain church members. You know, if somebody in the church is, you know, in unrepentant sin and the elders, you know, want to censure him, but, but that guy is the brother of, a, of the mayor. The mayor gets wind of it. And, you know, you can't do that. I'll find the church. You know, that's not the mayor's jurisdiction. Okay. And this also means that any magistrates who happen to be church members themselves, they are subject to the spiritual authority and discipline of the church. And so this distinction between church and state, you see it's critical, absolutely critical, if the church is to properly carry out its responsibilities as Jesus has uh, commanded us, including the responsibility of officers to discipline and censure their members. So, though it's short, this, this paragraph lays down foundational principles on Presbyterian government, and these principles are essential for understanding the nature and practice of discipline in Christ's church, and that's a subject that we will turn to next week when we get to paragraph two. But that ends the lesson tonight. 
Um, are there any questions?